everyone and welcome back. Today I'm going to film my July wrap up, however I am probably going to film it like split into different sections just because I don't think I have the capacity right now to sit here and talk about all the books I read this month. I read eight books in July, I'm actually filming this in August, so I read eight books in July, or at least I picked up eight books in July and read seven. So out of the eight books I read, two were audiobooks, two were novellas and one I DNF. The first book I'm going to speak about is Mother of Eden. This is the second book in the trilogy from Dark Eden. I reviewed Dark Eden last month and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I had already been pre-warned that this book wasn't going to be as great and I didn't find it that good. I gave it a 2 out of 5 because I just really felt like the book was a waste of my time um, and I felt like that when I read it and then I actually went on straight after to read Daughter of Eden um, and after reading Daughter of Eden I felt like this was a waste of my time even more simply because within the first 50 pages of this it recaps this story. I was like why did I have to read this whole thing then? But I'm trying to review it independently of the third book so let's get into that. In Mother of Eden we have now been sort of fast forwarded maybe 100-200 years um, from the original book um, and we are now seeing that the inhabitants of Eden have sort of spread out even further amongst Eden and there are basically two types of people. There are the John folks, so the people that followed John Red Lantern um, over to the other side and there are the David's folk which consider themselves the original family um, and unless you've read the book that means nothing to you but essentially the David folk is the original family and David was one of the people there who sort of rose through the ranks and was able to gain power um, as the sort of situation dismantled itself in Eden whereas John and his team were the sort of innovative leaders who left the original family and went on to found different types of families. You find out that although our original characters, um, Jeff, Tina, Spike Tree, there was someone else as well, um, all went with John, they ended up breaking away from John because it maybe there was some bickering and they all sort of founded their own sort of township. We follow our main character Starlight who is part of the Jeff, Jeff folk, Jeff's folk, um, and Jeff was one of the people who followed John across the snowy dark and he was a very I guess spiritual vibe guy, he was always talking about we are here, really reminds me of that phrase be here now and I know that a lot because I have it tattooed on my wrist but um, he just kept saying like we are here, he was very like spiritual and they just all thought he was a bit weird. Um, and we follow really our main character Starlight, this book does the same thing as the first book where it takes us through the perspectives, well we see the world through the perspectives of different characters um, but mainly we hear from Starlight and Starlight like I said lives on these folk and one day they decide to go over to Main Realm which is sort of the trading area because their society has grown so big that now they actually have a trading area where people can go and obviously trade things. The Jeff folk really keep to themselves, they've obviously really taken on the Jeff way of life which is you know no conflict, no violence, everyone gets along, everyone gets a chance to speak, they live a very simple life but Starlight itches for more and somehow manages to convince um, sort of her uncle um, her siblings to go over to main ground um, and when they go over to main ground she meets um, a man and this man you know is super handsome he's blown away by her she's absolutely stunning and he basically asks her to come back to his village with him and he is basically the second in line to be the ruler of the John folk and essentially what happens when Starlight reaches sort of the area of the John folk she gets to see the development and how far I guess the John folk has development but she's shocked at how I guess their society is there's a lot of hierarchy there hierarchy that, she, that doesn't exist where she comes from um, they've managed to develop metal they've you know plowed very very far ahead um, and it's basically after that becomes this little bit of an expedition where Starlight is now wearing the ring so the ring is one of the I guess mementos that they hold and because these people are living on Eden and they have very little things from Earth um, Mother Gila's ring is one of the most important things to them and this was a ring that was lost in the first book and found in the first book well it wasn't lost in the first book it was lost way before the first book um, but now of course the John folk have the ring and they have women who stand in for Mother Gila and wear the ring who go around to all the poor people like blessing them so it's so interesting to see that obviously they um, included that sort of royalty aspect there's a, obviously like I said a hierarchy but you know they've gone into making it a very sort of you know the queen is blessing you it's okay poor people like 
I guess there's no religion there so what they've done is use I guess the monarchy to sort of keep the small people at bay um, and for Starlight that's very different because it's not like where she comes from it's not like that where she comes from um, and that's essentially what happens in this story her she tries to make a change in the fact that she doesn't believe that what's going on is right that you know the little people shouldn't just be forced to work for the bigger people and um, talks about how unfair it is and yeah we get about hmm, 467 pages of that obviously we're hearing from different people we're hearing from people within the, the John's folk who are very upset that he's brought this woman and how they want to overthrow her and you know there's all of that in there but essentially there is not that great of a story here. What blew me away was the fact that Starlight was able to convince these people to go with her because it seemed like she was just like a girl that was on the end of her teenage years or something like that and I'm not really sure why they decided to follow her. It took them about 14 days to sail there um, and they thought they were just going to see it and then trade and then come back and then she ends up leaving. In the end, the reason, one of the reasons I dislike this book is because I felt that there were a lot of filler pages. It obviously went back to perspectives from other people but those people didn't add anything. It just felt like he was just trying to fill up the pages and in the end I was just reading this book and you know reading about Starlight and I was just like what is so special about this girl? There's absolutely nothing special about her girl. this girl. I get that she has itchy feet, a bit like John Red Lantern, but apart from the fact that she was really pretty, there was no re other reason than why he picked her, as in why Greenstone picked her to take him back with her. Um, so everything that happens after is just more a case of the fact that, you know, she doesn't believe these things should be like that, but you never get the impression that, you know, that's because of, like, very deep morals. I think she just kind of feels like, oh no, it shouldn't be like that, but then she never really goes around implementing really strict rules. Um, overall, I felt this book was a waste of my time. Like I said, I gave it a two out of five. So I then went on to straight away read this, um, and then it made um, Mother of Eden seem even more like a waste of my time. I ended up giving this book a three out of five stars. I have got halfway through this and was about to DNF it, but then the twist happened and I was like, okay, cool. This book is the only book that is from the perspective of one person. So in this book we hear from someone called Angie Red Lantern and Angie Red Lantern is actually the best friend of Starlight Brook, is that her name? Yeah, Starlight Brooking in this book. Um, but Angie is a bat face and when Starlight go, goes to the main ground she stays with her, um, her original people but then a shadow speaker comes to her island or whatever and she's so enamoured with her that she leaves. Now a shadow speaker is essentially like a prophet in this world, um, so it's the kind of person that goes around telling you that, you know, Mother Gila is with you, um, you have to do this because, you know, the mother is watching, she wants you to be doing these things. She goes to different villages and performs, you know, I don't know what she performs, but she starts shaking and convulsing and doing all those sorts of things. And Angie's really enamoured with her and I think she looks at Angie and tells Angie she's beautiful. Um, Angie's a bat face, which is someone who has a cleft palate, that's what they refer to people in this book. Um, so for her it's something that, you know, she feels that she had only heard from her mum but not from someone outside who looks normal. What happens in this book is we go between the past and the present, um, yeah, the past and the present and we're hearing about sort of Angie's time with Mary the Shadow Speaker and what her life is like now because now she isn't with Mary the Shadow Speaker, she's just sort of um, found a family, people that are part of the David's folk, yeah and she's with them and she's sort of recounting what she does. Then a major event happens and it, actually the major event happens within like the first couple of pages. Um, I think they're going to the main ground to exchange or trade and they see warriors from the Jordan folk side coming over and then they know they're sort of kind of about to be invaded. What I actually really liked about this book is that there was a war going on and obviously throughout the whole story of this but you didn't really get a war book which I'm very thankful for because I wouldn't have been able to read that I'm not interested in that but this book gets boring very quickly um, it gets boring very quickly because you're hearing about how they're walking away trying to get away from the people that are chasing them and then you know you're going back to the past and you're hearing about Angie as a shadow speaker and then comes a twist halfway through the book which is why I didn't DNF this book um, and to be honest, you can never make me a detective because I didn't see this twist coming. I didn't see the twist coming and honestly I was kind of over the twist, um, but it was very interesting to see how Chris handled this situation. I wish the twist would have come sooner in the book, but it was interesting to see how if you've been told something is coming for years and years and years, um, how you then react when it's staring you in the face and when it isn't what you expected. One of the things I guess I liked with the ending was there was this sort of resolve that wasn't 
good or bad. It was very interesting to see how if we develop as a society what happens when I guess the promise thing arrives and it isn't what you expect. Do you carry on with the life as you know it? What what changes? So yeah, the book saved itself with the twist because it was very interesting to find out all the different things and little developments that had happened um, and just how people generally reacted. One thing I want to say about this book, sorry, <laughs> something that I noticed is there is a reference to football in this book from Angie and I feel like it has just come out of nowhere because there is no way they could know about football. No, it's never mentioned in the book that they play football. And yeah, it was just so random. And I was just like, how does she know that reference? They like, never talk about them playing football. Like, I don't know. And especially because the language is so like stripped back and basic, I feel like it also wouldn't have been spelt football in the way we spell it now. So I picked up on that and I was just like, that's odd. That's really bloody odd. Overall, the series fell flat after book one. It was a bit of a failure. The last book I'm going to speak about right now is My Sister the Serial Killer. I listened to this on audiobook and I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars. I'm going to start off by saying if I had read um, a physical copy of this book uh, or on Kindle or whatever, I would have given it 2 out of 5 stars because I don't think the plot and the characters develop really well. It's a very simple story. You read it, you're confused at the beginning as to what is happening, especially from the title, and at the end you get no result, so you're still left confused, so whatever. The reason why I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars is because the audiobook was spectacular. Um, so the audiobook is narrated by someone, I think she might actually be Nigerian or her parents might be Nigerian. She narrates the book in a Nigerian accent and I think she does it brilliantly. Even as someone who's from West Africa, who's from Ghana, who's heard a lot of Nigerian people speak, like I would have read that book in the same way that I speak. So it was really good to hear her do it because it was exactly like how Nigerian people speak and I think it made it funny, it made it such a production, it just made it come alive and I really really enjoyed listening to it. Um, so My Sister the Serial Killer is basically what it says on tin. Um, our main character, our narrator, is talking about the fact that her sister keeps killing her boyfriends um, and we don't really know why and I guess her sister is trying to figure out why. I think she only asks her once why she does it and the sister doesn't even good, give a good enough answer which is beyond me. I'd be like okay there's you know sibling loyalty and protecting your family but you know, <laughs> you might end up dead too. But the book opens with the fact that our main character's sister, her name is Ayola, calls her and asks her to come over because she's killed another one of her boyfriends. So I think this is the second or third time her sister has helped her to dispose of a body. Um, and I guess her sister is just trying to recount their childhood reasons for why her sister might be doing this um, but it's also funny because she talks about how her sister Ayola is very spoiled you know how the mum jokes on her treats her as if she was a child you can see the ways in which Ayola is very taken care of she's very pampered and therefore you know she doesn't feel remorse for a lot of the things she does but it still doesn't explain why she's going around killing people like I get if people annoy you just break it off with them you don't actually have to kill them but the sort of reasoning she gives for all of this is you know he was going to hit me and obviously her sister can tell that's a lie anyway her sister the narrator works at a hospital and at the hospital she fancies like one of the head doctors and one day her sister Ayola comes into the hospital and the doctor sees her she sees the doctor basically they start dating um it's made very clear in the book that Ayola is the pretty sister but that is essentially the plot of the book we don't get a resolve at the end because the issue occurs between her and the doctor um Ayola does not get punished because Ayola can walk away from any situation scot-free and the book legit ends with another man being in their living room and the mum being like ah oh, come and introduce yourself to this man so you just know that the cycle begins again which is why I say there's no plot development there's no character development because you never ever find out why Ayola is doing the things she does they try to talk about her childhood and the things that happened to her but I don't actually think that's a justification aside from I guess the very I don't know basic writing and I'm really shocked it was on the women's prize for fiction aside from that the audiobook is fantastic fantastically produced and i encourage you to listen to it if you want to read this book because then you get a real feeling for the way nigerian people speak how they talk about things you know just the different tones in their voices and i think it makes it much more of a production and makes it much more enjoyable but that is me for now i'm going to talk about the other books that i read in july at another time but i can only stomach filming for this amount of time right now so i'll catch you in a bit bye